Hi. In this video, I want to talk a bit about the Poisson process and how that relates to our hazard calculations. So we've been so far with these hazard calculations computing a rate of exceedance. So there's a lambda on the vertical axis of all the thought plots on the previous video. And I want to relate that to probabilities of occurrence of events. And we're going to typically use the Poisson process assumption to do this. So here's a little review, not a seismic hazard focused topic, but just as a refresher on general probability. Poisson process is a process for events occurring in time that's got three specific properties. Those are noted in the middle of the slide here. So first of all, we've got stationarity. So the idea is that the rate of events is constant in time, and when it's not increasing or decreasing as time passes or since the time since the past event or anything like that. And we can say that mathematically, that if we go uh, in an interval from t to t plus h, that where h is some small interval, that the um, probability of an event is going to be lambda, the rate of occurrence of events, times that interval h. So as h gets longer, we'll have more events. And that lambda is a constant for all t, so it's not going up and down in time. Second property is this non-multiplicity. So this is the idea that we can't have two simultaneous events. Either no events happen in some little interval of time, or one event happen. But there's like a negligible probability of two events happening in a very short interval of time. And the third is independence, that the if we look in some interval in the past and we're making some statement about the number of events in the future, that we have those, as long as those intervals are non-overlapping, that the number of events is going to be independent. So knowing what happened in the past doesn't influence my knowledge of what could happen in the future. That's the idea. Okay, so those are the three kind of mathematical conditions for these processes where we have constant rate of events that are independent of what's happened in the past. And we can say, looking at the top line of text, that if we count the number of events in some interval of time t0, that the number of events x is going to be a random variable, and that's going to have a Poisson distribution. And then you have to specify some parameter for that distribution, and we would specify lambda, the rate of events per unit time, times t0, the amount of time that's passed. That would be our parameter, and then we could use a Poisson distribution to count the number of events, and we'll use that in a moment. Okay. And then the graphic we can think about down here at the bottom is that we start at time zero and then time's passing. And we have these events that are occurring, which is marked with black dots to illustrate kind of one realization. And as, the, as time passes, the events are not getting more or less frequent on average. And if we observe some interval of time in the past and then we're looking forward into the future, the number of events or the, the likelihood of an event occurring in some interval of time is going to be independent of what's happened previous to that when we start that statement. That's the number three idea. And then also if we pick some interval of time t0, that's the amount of time since time zero, the number of events that's happened. So in this realization, it would have been five. In some other realization, it would be a different number. That number of events is going to have a Poisson distribution. OK, so let's add another detail here to this Poisson process. We're going to call it a Poisson process with random selection. And so the idea here is that if I've got this process, for example, those black dots that gave me the realizations from the, the process or events from the process, and those events uh, were occurring with rate lambda, with this process with random selection, we're going to select events from a Poisson process uh, randomly, which means also independently per event, with probability p and then selected events are Poisson, and they have rate lambda p. Squeeze this in down here. So the idea, let's draw a little picture that might help. So we'll say we pick events randomly up here, and let's say we're picking them with probability 0.5, roughly. Or yeah, let's just say 0.5 to pick a number. And we're picking them randomly, so we may not get exactly half. We're not going to do either other or anything like that. Um, so this is events with random selection, and they're going to have rate lambda p, and they will be Poisson as well. Okay, And this uh, extra extension here is going to be relevant um, for the next slide. So what's, how we're going to think about it is as follows. So we're going to have kind of our, our earthquakes will be our basic Poisson process, and we're going to say those earthquakes are occurring with rate lambda. And for instance, if it's all earthquakes greater than the minimum magnitude we're interested in, they'll have a rate of lambda m greater than or equal to m min, like we talked about from our earlier data analysis or source processes or source models. Some of those earthquakes are going to have a magnitude greater than m 
where m is some user specified number bigger than six or bigger than seven, something like that. That's going to be a Poisson process with random selection. Right? And what we'll do is we'll have the original lambda, lambda greater than m min, and then we'll have a p probability of selection. And for instance, that'd be the probability that a given event has magnitude greater than m, which we can compute as one minus the CDF. Right? And so we've got a random selection of just the larger magnitude events. That's still going to be a Poisson process if the underlying earthquakes are a Poisson process. Similarly, we could think about earthquakes that produce a ground motion with an intensity measure greater than small im. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to have the rate of the ruptures, that'll be our lambda. And if we say that rupture i is a Poisson process, then we'll say some of those events from that Poisson process are going to cause an im greater than im. And that's our ground motion model prediction, the p. So we've got a lambda times a p here that's going to give us the Poisson process with random selection, just selecting the, the I, im exceedances. We also have a summation here in this case, so this is a little extra step. But the idea here is that if the occurrences of rupture i are a Poisson process, and then we have rupture 1, rupture 2, rupture 3, and so on, and we add up those events. If we look at the properties of the Poisson process from the previous slide about stationarity, non-multiplicity independence. If we superimpose the occurrences from multiple Poisson processes, like the uh, uh, magnet uh, earthquake events from the various ruptures, none of those properties can be violated if the underlying events from rupture I are also a Poisson process. The summation doesn't affect the kind of Poisson nature of these things. It does, of course, increase the rate if we're adding up the rates from multiple processes, but it's still Poisson. So we can say basically these upper two lines here, these are both Poisson processes with random selection. And as long as those underlying earthquakes are a Poisson process, we can continue on treating all of these three situations as Poisson processes, right? And I've got the little drawing to the left thinking about of all the black earthquakes, some of them are getting selected into these other categories, but the remaining events are still gonna be a Poisson process just with a different rate but we have the formulas on the right to solve for those rates. Okay, if we have a Poisson process, what does that uh, give us in terms of information? All right, we've got a rate. Um, we also have a couple other metrics we can compute. So one is a return period, and this is the mean time interval between events. And um, so it's just the mean, it's not you know, expected value. It doesn't mean that the next interval is going to be exactly this, but on average, how long is it between events? And this is one over the lambda for the Poisson process. And this should be pretty intuitive, right? If I have an event occurring 0.1 times per year, the mean amount of time between events is going to be one over 0.1 or 10 years. The other result we can get at here is this probability of n greater than or equal to one, where n is the number so the number of events in time t, we watch for some interval of time t, how many events are occurring from this process. We c if, it's a, if it's a Poisson process, we can set up the, let's use this equivalence. Okay, so if it's a Poisson process, we said two slides earlier that the number of events in some time interval has a Poisson distribution. So we can use that Poisson distribution to get at this probability. We can also use an exponential distribution, the time to the next event, to get at that probability. But either way, we need the Poisson process assumption. So we say that's one minus e to the minus lambda t, where lambda is the rate of events in this process. Also, there's a pretty good approximation for small lambda t. So if lambda t is small, that probability is pretty close to the rate times the amount of time, right? And we can see a little illustration here down on the on the figure to the right. So I've got plotted the expected number of occurrences, lambda t. So if we have 0 0.1 events per year and we watch for two years, we would expect to see 0 0.1 times two or 0 0.2 events. And on the vertical axis, we've got this probability, the more precise probability plotted here. And we can see that the two of them track closely on a one-to-one -one line down in the very left bottom corner. But as the rates get bigger, we get bigger than about 0.1, then those two lines diverge. The, the blue line is, is the, the relationship between these two, and the one-to-one -one line is diverging off. Right? So we could note that the approximation is good for small t, i.e. 
lambda t less than or equal to 0 0.1 or so. It's a pretty good approximation. And for bigger than that, they diverge, right? And if you go over to the far, you can imagine why that those two are not equivalent. So if we have one event per year and we watch for two years, the expected number of occurrences would be two, but the probability of an occurrence can't be two, right? It can't exceed one. So you can see the probability is getting high over it here for an expected number of occurrences of two, but it's not even exceeding one, not even reaching one, let alone exceeding one. Whereas if we go down to the lower left corner, if there's, if we expect to see 0 0.1 events over some interval of time, the probability of observing an event is also about 0 0.1. Okay, so that's a useful formula. And again, this formula relies on the Poisson process to move from our rate calculations into the probability in some interval. Let's do, put a little math to this. Um, so here, let's talk about we will oftentimes in our later analysis, think about ground motion amplitudes. So we're, we're talking about a, an IM value that has an exceedance rate of 0 0.0021 events per year. Let's spell this out a little bit because there's a chance this can be um, confusing for some folks. We're thinking about an exceedance. So we're thinking about IM greater than IM. So that's an exceedance. And then the rate, so I'm interested in the rate, how often does that happen? So the IM could be any number as long as it's greater than this low IM, and it counts as an event in the Poisson process, but it's still an event in the Poisson process. So let's, if we back up a couple slides to see this, the same text in actions, lambda of IM greater than IM. And we talked about that in two slides back, we had earthquakes with IM greater than IM, and we can find a rate of exceeding that IM, but there are specific events, right? So I can talk about What's, what's the probability of one exceedance? I'm not exceeding one event. I'm exceeding one event has exceeded the IM threshold, right? So the exceedance is, is referring to the greater than or equal to inside of this parentheses that defines an event, but we're still going to count those events, right? We're thinking about a ground motion amplitude IM that has lambda of um, 0 0.0021 events per year, right? And that's some value we could read off of a hazard curve. So the question is, let's compute the return period and the probability of exceedance in 50 years for this amplitude. So first off, return period is pretty easy. So this is just one over lambda over or one over 0 0.0021 and events is that implicit that the year I'll note here just to track our units. So if we put that in a calculator, we get 475 and in the year it will pop up into the numerator. So it's an average of 475 years between events where we see an exceedance of that IM amplitude. Okay. So 0.0021, that's a weird looking number. 475 years, that's a weird looking number. But let's compute the probability of exceedance. So what I want to find is what's the probability that I see at least one of those events, more than one of those events could be fine as well, in t equals 50 years. I'll just spell that out to remind ourselves that we've got to specify t. So that's going to be 1 minus e to the minus lambda t, or 1 minus e to the minus 0 0.0021 times 50. And then 0021 has events, or units of years to the minus 1, 50 has units of years, so that, that numerator is unitless. And we'll end up with just a number, which is a probability or of 0 0.1. All right, so that's a nice round number. And in text, we could say we have a 10% probability 0.1, probability of exceedance in 50 years. And this is an amplitude that we often will go find from our hazard analysis and then use that to specify forces on a building for checking when we do a design. The thinking here is that if we talked in our code language or we spoke to our building owners about events that occurred 0 0.0021 times per year, right, that sounds like a very small number, also funny units, hard to imagine. If we talked about an event with a 475 year return period or even a 500 year return period, right, that sounds very infrequent. That's a huge number compared to our lifespan. So it doesn't sound like anything we need to worry about. But if we think about designing a building and it's nominally gonna last 50 years, hopefully longer, and we say over the lifespan of that building, there's a 10% probability that we'll see a ground motion at least this big as this I am. That sounds not inconsequential and sounds like we should be checking to make sure the performance will be satisfactory in that event. And so we can anchor ourselves to this 50 year time span using the Poisson process probability. We can work backwards to what's the rate 
associated with that. And it's this 0.0021. So that's where that comes from. When we do our hazard calculations, we'll be thinking about that number sometimes. Okay. So that's a little reminder about Poisson processes, how they link into our earthquake occurrences and ground motion occurrences, and then some formulas to help us find probabilities. And just to remind ourselves, the Poisson process is the most common assumption when we do hazard analysis, assuming that these events are occurring as a Poisson process. It's not required, right? If we have evidence that the earthquakes are, are non-Poisson and that there's some memory to them, we can always still compute rates, but we could have those rates vary over time, or we could not use these Poisson probability formulas to find the probability of occurrence in some interval. So that's possible, but it's, it makes the math a little bit more complicated. It's available if you want to look it up, but for this basic treatment of uh, hazard analysis, Poisson processes is, is definitely the, the most common and the, the one that we'll focus on here. Okay, so that's all for now.